welcome to the Third Coin Podcast, a conversation about the past, present, and future of blockchain, crypto, NFTs, and technology. This program is hosted by Grant Cermak, Dan Mueller, and myself, Louis May. Our show could be described as a series of discussions, interviews, questions, answers, opinions, and maybe some conversation about what is the Third Coin. All right. Hello. Welcome to the Third Coin Podcast. My name is Louis May, and I'm here with Grant Cermak and Dan Mueller. And today we're going to talk about some of the fundamentals of cryptocurrency, starting with just a little bit of talk about Bitcoin, what's going on, some current events, and proof of work, and what that means as far as what we call the first coin. Good day, gentlemen. Grant, how are you today? Great. Yeah. Beautiful day where I live. So the sun is shining. Can't, can't complain. Awesome. Dan, how are you? Exactly the same. Doing great. Happy to be here. Beautiful day. Nice. Nice. Let's, uh, let's fire it off. Grant, there's been some news in cryptocurrency with, in Bitcoin as far as that they launched a new update that they've been working on from what I've read for seems like about six months almost. Can you tell me more about that? Might even be longer than that. So Bitcoin tends to move fairly slowly. And I think that's a bit by design. It, it being the top dog or king of all cryptocurrencies, they don't want to do anything necessarily that's too controversial or destabilizing. The last major change that happened was the SegWit update. I think that happened back in something like 2017. So it's, it's been a while since there's been any substantive change. And this isn't a, a fork, so this is a, a soft upgrade. So it's most it's backwards compatible with things that have happened in the past and enabling some new functionality. So it's something called Taproot, and it's enabling Bitcoin to move into the space of smart contracts and DeFi and trying to more directly compete with stuff that's been happening on other chains in Ethereum and elsewhere. So it's, it's a pretty big deal, but it remains to be seen if you know, Bitcoin really ends up being the place where people want to do a lot of this type of programming and how to dislodge sort of the behemoth, the uh, amount of momentum that Ethereum has. I think the only thing that's still giving people a lot of concern about using Ethereum for all of this stuff is just the high gas fees and the amount of actual stuff that can happen on that chain per unit time. It's okay. just that there's so much desire to do things there. But I think being able to do Bitcoin native DeFi and smart contract programming in Bitcoin, this will prove to be a very important update in the long run because you'll be able to do more interesting stuff natively inside of the Bitcoin blockchain using okay. the default way to do this in Bitcoin rather than trying to wrap it and do it on some other chain. Does that solve some of the problems or in theory, the problem of high gas fees? Is there going to be gas fees with this taproot you said? There, there are transaction fees associated with every coin, right? That's how things work. It's the incentive for the people who are running the computers that actually do this distributed system to continue to maintain it. it it's okay. the incentive for doing anything. And the fees are what allow you to have some amount of ordering to the blocks. If you didn't have any kind of fee structure, then there'd be no incentive for running a, a mining node other than the coins that you might earn. But sure. as the coin reward is decreasing over time, it was always thought that fees were going to overtake coin rewards as being the reason to continue to I, and I actually mining. read something about that just the other day, because when Bitcoin mines its last coin, when the chain lines, mines its last coin, what's going to be the incentive for all of these huge computer systems to remain online and continue to process transactions, right? These are those things. Dan, yep. anything to add so, to all of that? Another well, Grant's 100% right. I was just looking into some of the details of this Taproot update, and one of them is... Uh, the Schnorr signatures, which look like they're going to um, take less space to create transactions. I was wondering if Grant knows anything about that or where else that's used. Where else taproot? You no, know, the Schnorr signatures, part of the taproot 
uh, yeah the, I, and the, it's my understanding a bit synonymous with those two terms it's like a okay. tapered is like another way to refer to that general like it's I, I don't even know if i'm pronouncing that word but those generalized signatures are like the cryptographic underlying technique for how you enable this sort of stuff and this is felga card sure. shit that who, the, who who can understand this stuff right. only like three people on the planet really get this cryptography stuff it's, that's god emperor stuff that's above my level of understanding speaking of god emperor smart guy stuff i saw brom cohen congratulated bitcoin on being one of the blockchains that now has <laughs> tap root support and i was some telling tongue in cheek there because i know there are new coin uh, chia has that of course and so that was funny i still don't understand why it's funny but i get that i should probably laugh anyway so it, it says that this is going to allow for more privacy in transactions and i'm wondering how that in on the bitcoin blockchain at least according to what i'm reading on cnbc and i don't know enough about it to really comment on that but i'm wondering how that's really possible since it's a public ledger do you understand it maybe ask the question one more time i'm not, not what are you asking about they're saying that the uh, one of the most important changes though it is backward compatible and doesn't break anything doesn't require a fork is that it enables the possibility of smart contracts on the bitcoin blockchain and that also that the snore snore signatures can allow for more privacy and i don't really understand how that's possible yeah I, i'm not sure about that M more privacy to me seems like it's a almost an all or nothing thing. I don't know how you can have more, like in my understanding. Some privacy. We're having some <laughs> privacy okay. on this. So it says Taproot <laughs> upgrade aims to increase privacy for certain transactions. To do this, Schnorr, Schnorr, Schnorr signatures will ultimately allow for multi-signature transactions or those that involve multiple addresses to appear as a standard single transaction. Multi-signature transactions are often used to enable smart contracts, among other things. As a result, multi-signature transactions will be indistinguishable from single transactions, meaning greater anonymity and privacy for addresses involved in multi-signature transactions. So if I have a Bitcoin wallet and I've done a bunch of transactions, so I have a bunch of couch cushion Bitcoins off the control of one private key, I'm just extrapolating here and wondering, does that mean that I can I send all those coins in one place? With I think it has something to do with multi-sig transactions, which is not a standard transaction. I think it has more to do with like when you're doing coin joins or coin muxing kind of stuff, it may enable some form of transaction like that to be more difficult to distinguish what's really going on there versus the current implementation of it. But again, this stuff is fairly obtuse and complex, and I don't know that I'm ready to comment sure. on it in detail. Let, let's back off this a second, because I think that you're touching on to one of the big misnomers of Bitcoin in particular, and a lot of the other coins that are well known, is that people think they're private and that when you make a transaction using one of these things, nobody can know who you are. Is that true? I Okay, so at the beginning, when you create an address or an address holds some coins, there's nothing inherently that tells anybody who that address belongs to so if you That's do an things, address on the blockchain okay so th there's nothing inherent that sort of tells somebody who that address represents in real way in, in physical reality or who controls it now there are a lot of things that go on associated with addresses that make not necessarily the case so there's a lot of uh, what happens in the crypto space and in the stock trading space that's called know your customer kyc you will oftentimes be put through KYC processes by banks, legal and governmental institutions that mandate this type of stuff. So when you go through KYC and on Coinbase or Kraken or something like that, every single address that's generated for you there is tied to an identity that is you. And at that point, you've been doxxed for all intents and purposes, because now everything you do that's related to any of those coins now can be fingerprinted back to that original, you know, on-ramp. And on-ramp is an important concept in crypto and in Bitcoin, because what on-ramp means is it, it's how do you get into this space in the first place? Like most people do not start from farming coins and then have sort of virgin coins that don't have any tie to them to begin with. And that's really the only place to get truly anonymous coins is to make them yourself, to farm them or mine them or whatever it is that the cryptocurrency you're, you're talking about allows for the creation of you know, new coins. 
anything else has some on-ramp component to it. You're somewhere doing something. Now, in the early days of Bitcoin, there were a lot of coin meetup. Like you would go meet somebody in a back alley, give them some cash, and they would transfer you some crypto and sort of things were fairly anonymous. But that's sort of faded. That doesn't really happen as much anymore. Now you go to Coinbase. Yeah, you and you're not KYC. doing that anymore? <laughs> no, for, for one thing, I've read about the FBI or other people arresting people who try to trade crypto for cash because they claim they're enabling terrorism, even though Bank of America and U.S. Bank actually launder billions of dollars for terrorists and drug yeah. dealers. Bitcoin's so never matter. been proven to, yeah, Bitcoin's not related to terrorism as far as anyone can tell. Uh, at least I've never seen any documented uh, terrorism with the possible exception of some Bitcoin in the Silk Road back in the, the early days. Ross Albrick serving multiple life terms for running a drug dealing marketplace and allegedly uh, trying to hire an assassin. So I don't know, maybe he deserves to be there, maybe not, but it seems like pretty harsh considering he was just operating a website for the most part. But no, yeah, you used to be able to buy Bitcoin in cash. And the way I originally bought Bitcoin, as I uh, may have mentioned before, was um, through Mt. Gox. And at the time, the way to do that was you would, uh, it was some sort of uh, shenanigans with Western, Western Union and uh, their ATM network and some codes. So you'd literally feed cash into the machine and it would print out a coupon with a code on it. And you go back to Mt. Gox and punch in your code and you'd prearrange to buy X number of Bitcoin and they would tell you how much money you'd have to feed into the ATM. The whole thing took a couple of hours and, and it'd, it'd be done. Um, but yeah, now you have KYC, which means you have to uh, go to Coinbase or one of the big exchanges and you have to- We all had show to give them our ID, ID to do that essentially. Now there are still ways of being private and let me touch on that for a second because I, yeah. I I get a thrill out of this sort of thing like how do I circumvent all these controls they've set up to to get into my business which they have no business getting in my business in the first place so one of them is uh, using a VPN <clears throat> to connect to exchanges that don't have KYC requirements and there are some but they are not allowed to operate in the United States because of American laws. So okay. you can fire up a VPN and appear to be in Europe or someplace with better and we're data not, privacy Hold laws. on, we're not condoning that anyone do this by any means, nope. but if you and were going to do this, it either, but, this uh, is how you would do it. Right. Yes. If okay. you were to do this thing, which may not be legal in your area, this is how you would do it. You'd fire up a VPN, appear to be in Sweden or Switzerland or someplace with, you know, more privacy than America. And then you'd go to an exchange. Uh, There's more privacy than America? Yeah. We're... Are they more free there too? Absolutely. And they have better benefits and better dental plan. It's, Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. It's... <laughs> Sorry it's to interrupt. Please continue. I know. It's disheartening. I, I love America. But no, we, we were uh... rated uh, 28th in the freedom scale. Yeah. We... All, so there's 27 or 22 countries that are more free than we are, but. Right. But, and That's they better shut up about it. We'll come over there and bring them some freedom too. <laughs> yeah, we're going to show them what freedom's all about. <laughs> The true American export. <laughs> so anyway, my, my point is that somebody else can mine those virgin coins that Grant was just talking about and put them on an exchange so they can pay for the electricity and for their hardware investment. So yep. somebody else can buy those coins. And if they buy them without having KYC, then they have in effect gotten coins that they can't be traced to as okay. long as they're careful about what they do with them afterwards. And then from there, so that's one way. And then the other way is privacy coins, which the U.S. government is really basically wants to call illegal. They're making it hard, but they can't really, they don't have authority to govern any of this stuff. They may think they do, they may try, but you can't, they can't stop it. Okay. Like China, they can make it illegal. How many times has China made Bitcoin illegal in the last 10 years? I don't even know. But every time they do, the price dips, people buy the dip and the price goes back up. And then, so it might just be a scheme for buying cheap Bitcoin and cheap crypto. But yeah, Monero and there's three main privacy coins I'm aware of. Monero, Zek, and, uh, and Verge, which is privacy optional. It has rate which protocol. Has, which has an interesting pedigree. I, they were originally called Dogecoin Dark, right? Yes, yes. Dogecoin Dark, okay. yes. Hmm. So if you want the true Dogecoin, then start with Verge because it's the privacy enabled Dogecoin. For it. That's the Doge with the trench coat and the dark alley. Yeah, Okay. So. Interesting. privacy coins do exist, but the IRS will pay you 600 and almost over a half million dollars if you can reverse engineer a Monero transaction. I don't think they've figured out what Verge is yet. And Verge is cheap. It's uh, under three cents a coin right now. So I picked up. Yeah, I, I think, look at, so just to, to finish off the question that you, most cryptocurrencies have 
no privacy uh, built into it. That means that if an address is ever uh, fundamentally tied to you and they prove that you were able to do some pieces of transactions or that you have done some transactions and it, uh, and it doxes you, then it doxes every transaction you've ever done. And people can definitely sleuth that out because every coin is tied to every other coin through these transactions. And the only ones that sort of don't have this are <clears throat> Monero, Verge, and I, I'm not familiar with Zek particularly, but Verge and uh, Monero I'm, I'm intimately familiar with. And these ones are are very highly known for enabling privacy, that it's it's really hard to tell what's going on in that chain in any substantive way. Zcash is Zek. And actually I just Googled this. So apparently there's Dash too. I don't know anything about that either, but. Okay. Let, well, let's talk about one kind of the, another fundamental, because that is one of the big fundamentals was privacy here. And, and uh, so another topic that I wanted to touch on is being the first coin, Bitcoin, because the name of our podcast is The Third Coin. So we'll get to that someday. But I fight, obviously we need to identify the first and the second coin and maybe speak about them a little bit more about why they're the first coin. So Bitcoin's the first coin, obviously, and it's what's called a proof of work coin. Could you elaborate on what does that mean, proof of work? Proof of work means that you have to do something, right, to secure the coin. If there was nothing you had to do, then there's a zero barrier to entry to try to attack the, the chain. And as we've spoken about in previous, in previous episodes, what you're doing fundamentally with the blockchain is you're trying to compute the next block, the mutation to the database, the next version of it. In proof of work, you are asking for the miners to do something that costs them something. So they have to do a proof by doing some amount of work. And this amount of work is doing a really hard math problem. And that really hard math problem gets harder and harder over time as the difficulty increases. So what they're, what's fundamentally happening within a proof of work coin is that you have to solve a really hard math problem and whoever comes up with that solution, it's a race to find that solution. So the more, resources that you can throw at doing that really hard math problem, the more likely it is that you're going to find that solution. So in proof of work, you use compute resources to solve a hard math problem. And by doing that, you're able to compute the next block and that allows you to earn a reward of coins also along with whatever kinds of transaction fees are associated with that next block. So if there's 500 transactions that want to go into the next block. Each of those has some tran transaction fee associated with it. The miner gets all the transaction fees and they get the reward for the block. So there's a big incentive to, to doing this. That's what proof of work means. It's proof that you've uh, done some work on the chain and that you deserve some reward because you've solved the hard math problem. This person that finds that block, that there can only be that's... one winner. So that leads to my next question. So let's just make some hypotheticals to, so that I can understand this. Let's say there's 10 people, 10, 10 systems mining for Bitcoin. Obviously there's way more tens of thousands or whatever, but let's say there's 10 and number 10 has a huge computer system. So he's obviously got the best chance of mining this next coin. And let's say he's using a hundred kilowatts an hour, okay? And one through nine, they have a much smaller one-tenth the size and they're using 10 kilowatts per hour. So they're doing computations this whole time. Is this number 10, is he always going to win? What hap And when he wins, what happens to the other nine? Do they get any reward for the computations they've done? No, you don't. If you don't win the block, everything that you did to try to win the block is lost. Now, pools change that equation because what you do with pools is you join up as a team and you say, if any one of us wins, then we all win some proportion of this. And that makes it so that your reward earning over time evens out. So it's like an agreement. If you and I were both running one of the ones that you said, and either of us wins, then we both uh, get paid half. So that way, you don't just lose all the time. You win when I win and I win when you win. And so by so nobody that, in their right mind running these small systems is not pooling their resources with other small systems. Then. Not necessarily. It's not a, it's not a guarantee that you want to pool. It depends on how much compute power you really have to throw at it. Like you don't have to have that much compute power in these systems to make it 
worthwhile to mine solo. If you think about the block reward, it's substantive. <laughs> if you win some amount of BTC, that's worth quite a bit of money. Splitting that up amongst thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people that are doing something as well, that makes it feel like you, you know, really lost out. So it, it depends if you're very small and you don't have a lot of hashing power, then you definitely want to pool because the amount of time it could take you to actually win a block could stretch on to years or the lifetime of the universe or something. You're not okay. going to win. Uh, so what about in this scenario that I just built, where you have a machine that's 10 times more powerful than the other nine machines. So it's running at hundred kilowatts versus 10 kilowatts. Are these 10 kilowatt machines ever, are they going to just win approximately one out of 10 coins then? Approximately. Yeah. They should win one tenth of the, whatever you sum the entire space of the people who are participating and trying to win. And then whatever proportion you have, you should win a proportionate amount. Oh, of time. so it'd be one out of 20 then, because you have a hundred unit and then nine, 10 units. I'm not trying to check your math. I'm just sure, trying sure. to give you the but general no, idea. No, okay. But that, that like to check my math, it would be one out of 19 if officially then. But so I just trying I think to think it's I think it's one out of 20, but yeah. Okay. Okay, I got, I got yeah. a couple things here. Yeah, please. One, I needed to correct my ignorance from before. I said at least three privacy coins. I had no idea how many there were. So on CoinMarketCap, 87, they have a page for privacy coins. It's a filter you can run. There's at least 87 privacy coins. Okay. And I answered my own question as to why Verge is not higher in price. Uh, Decred is is uh, pretty high up on the list and it's uh, over a hundred bucks a coin. And uh, there's a bunch of coins, 87 of them. I put the link there in the chat. The other thing is when we're talking about proof of work and farming, and if you're going to be in a pool or if you're going to be solo mining, one thing to consider is that you don't have to, if you want to earn Bitcoin, you don't necessarily have to farm Bitcoin individually or in a pool, you can farm some shit coin. It's using the same algorithm that your GPU or that your ASICs or whatever equipment you have can, can work. And if it's a small enough coin and the exchange rate is favorable and your price of electricity, there's a lot of things you gotta figure out. You can actually do pretty well farming a shit coin and then exchanging it for Bitcoin, Ethereum or whatever you wanna hodl. Okay. And that's, so you have to do all, if you're a miner, you have to do all of these calculations. Do you want to be farming up or, or mining a Bitcoin fork for much less dollars, but have le way less competition? Therefore your CPUs don't go to waste and you actually win the blocks. Your CPUs will always go to waste in some sense, because anytime a block is won by someone else, all of that effort that you expended is in some sense wasted. So yes, there is a tremendous amount of waste in proof of work because oh, actually, so most <laughs> of the CPUs are wasted because Correct. anytime there's more, only anytime there's more than one CPU going after a fork, whatever fork that is, that's a mining fork. All the other ones that don't win it are fork, wasted fork, energy. For your example of the ten people that are mining. Yep. All 10 of them are spending money on electricity. All 10 of them are wasting CPU cycles. One of them that gets the reward. If you're pooling a three, two or three of them share that reward, but all 10 of them are spending all the electricity. It's so it's energy calculation on the, on Bitcoin, for example, is it, 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 when, when a Bitcoin gets mined, it's all of the CPUs in the entire world that are mining Bitcoins and the energy cost of every single one of those CPUs go into effect effectively are the energy consumption that it took to mine the one coin that only one CPU was rewarded. That's simplifying it, but yes, essentially you sum the entire space of all the people who are chasing the next block. And then you divide it by the block reward. So you know, the block reward changes over I time. I mean, this is way more than $60,000 of energy then. Right? Likely, yes. I, I mean, probably. Has anybody ever, have you, has anybody looked at it like that yet? The like, energy, yes. The energy costs yeah. have been calculated frequently. <laughs> These are things you can find for sure. It's not a fun number to look at from an environmental perspective in any way. It's horrific. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, definitely... it's not even twice as much. It's got to be like millions, if not billions of dollars of energy consumption for a hundred thousand dollars. No, it, not it, it's not, that bad. it's not that bad because it, here's how things work. Like the hashing power changes over time and people bring their mining rigs on and offline 
whenever it's not profitable. You can mine into a profitability hole, but then you have to ask yourself, why would I take $500 of electricity in a given month and put it towards earning $300 worth of Bitcoin? Yeah. Why would I do that? I mean, I could take that $500 and just go buy Bitcoin. It doesn't make right. any sense. Okay, this so is the market dictates or the mining that's taking place dictates what everybody does because everybody who's mining is always monitoring it's, that. It's, the, it's known as mining profitability. And as a miner, you always have to do this calculus and determine whether you keep that rig on or off. Sometimes when the price of a coin plunges, it becomes very obvious that you should not be mining anymore. And most of the time, over the entire life of all <laughs> crypto proof of work, the answer is you should not be mining. You should just go buy the coin. It never makes sense to mine. It almost never makes sense to mine. Wow. Now, okay. <laughs> this is a very like well-known thing. Like you almost never make money mining. Huh. It's that better to just go mind. buy the coin. <laughs> okay. If you do it with enough scale and you sell what you need to pay for your costs and recoup your costs and put a little aside for the next upgrade that you're going to have to do to keep up with this proof of work war game, nuclear arms race. What you're hoping for is that you can skim some tiny fraction of that set aside for when it moons. Well, um, wait a minute. There, there are certain institutions and large players that have a big advantage here. So yes. as the hashing rate's gone up on Bitcoin, there, this, this arms race is how much more hashing power can you buy per dollar? with the money that you would spend on the new mining rig. If you're first to the new mining rig and you get it early enough, you have 10 X advantage over everybody else until they get access to the new gear. This ASICs arms race that happened over, you know, the course of five something years that has been going on with the Moore's law increase in computing power on Bitcoin. If you get early access to that, you suddenly have a substantially better chance of winning. And so there are certain situations where mining can be inordinately profitable and incredibly valuable. And the other thing is, if you have zero energy costs, you also have an advantage over people who have to pay for energy. If you, for instance, put your Bitcoin mining rigs over the top of some free energy source, like I think El Salvador is Bitcoin mining over the top of a geothermic, whatever. And it's not easy to export energy. If you have an excess right. of energy somewhere on the planet, uh, trans the perfect thing to do with that excess transforming energy. energy into Bitcoin is a pretty good way to use that energy, which is otherwise just going to be radiated out into the planet or space. And there yeah. are certain places on the planet that are like this. I think one of them is there, they burn off excess methane on the oil rigs or whatever. So they're okay. just burning it. They're generating heat. Nothing is happening with that. They're just trying to keep methane from entering the atmosphere or whatever. They've got to do something with it. They can't like to actually capture as much as they are, or they're not capturing it and doing anything with it. So they just burn it off. Okay. If you put a, I don't know, steam turbine over the top of that and generate electricity off of it and turn that into Bitcoin, now you've just captured something. And I think that's happening in Texas. So there are certain places where Bitcoin mining is uh, pretty profitable, but if you as just like a regular user that are just tapping into the grid and running your rigs in somebody's basement, it's not obvious that Bitcoin mining is the right thing to do. Interesting. I saw, I forget where, I think somewhere in my Reddit feed, these police in Europe, Eastern Europe, raided this house thinking that the people there were growing marijuana because of the heat high energy usage. Yeah. And heat signature, like <clears throat> the snow on their roof was melted. Everybody else had snow on their roof. That's it's sort of obvious dumbass stuff that, you know. And so they went there expecting to bust them for weed, but what they found was a whole bunch of Bitcoin ASICs running with stolen electricity. They bypassed the meter and they were just oh. totally stealing electricity from the grid to, to mine Bitcoin. So they, they arrested them anyways. All, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, who, whichever sucker was on watch that day got arrested, I'm sure. But yeah, everybody else was like, ooh. But yeah, it's funny uh, how times have changed. And Okay. So what just happened uh, last current event, something uh, just... And I, you guys know about it. I don't. Uh, it's a new word to me or a new company or something. Bitcoin is down under 60,000 because of this uh, bankruptcy of this company? I don't think so. I think the sp down spike in the price of uh, crypto, anytime you see one of these big down spikes, oftentimes, uh, if you really dig into it, it's the unwinding of leverage. So leverage is this well-known thing in 
finance terms where you can borrow and buy above your current means. A lot of times when crypto gets bought or when anything gets bought, it gets bought on leverage and with borrowed money. And so then what happens is people get into an extended position. They've borrowed to buy something and they don't have the real, you know, the, they don't have enough money to really pay for what they've got. And so if there's a down spike in the price, leveraged positions that have borrowed money to pay for stuff, Okay. get what's called margin called, or they get a liquidity call. And what happens then is your underlying asset gets sold off forcibly. And when a big leveraged position builds up, it becomes obvious to certain traders that position can be unwound by spiking the price downward. So under certain oh, well, market can... It's be <laughs> beneficial for these whales to do that because it's spiking yeah, down they dump and... They dump a bunch of Bitcoin and they bankrupt all these people. And then by dumping all this it Bitcoin, it goes down even lower 000, because of that. Price, exactly. And then they you make, buy it all back. You, you and, make money, you make money on the spread. Yeah, you okay. make money on the gotcha. spread. So what was so this if, other if, company that went bankrupt that everybody thought was because the reason why, did you guys hear about that? Evergrande in China? Yeah, or? Evergrande. Yeah. What were they doing? The financial markets are all very intertwined. What's going on in China could possibly have some ties into crypto where there's speculation that certain crypto assets are getting sold off to do things in certain cases. That is not obvious that's occurring. I, I think the easier story is more likely, which is you get a bunch of leverage that gets overextended and then those micro bubbles pop. That's what you see when the price rapidly rises. A good thing in finance that I say is prices that quickly go up, quickly go down. The things that take longer to build up are more likely to be true fundamentals. So if you see a rapid in increase in the price of a crypto asset, Bitcoin or anything else, that's likely not going to stay for very long. But if it rises a small amount over a unit time and holds on to it, those tend to stick around. More stable. Okay. Any, anything to add to that, Dan? Uh, no, Grand Ale. So, so Evergrande is just a company that was supposedly some of their assets were held in Bitcoin. So then they had to sell their Bitcoin to pay for their financial troubles, supposedly, and that's what was people were speculating. But these you're, markets you're, have got these markets have gotten large for okay. any one player to spike a spike the price down by that yeah. substantive amount. Oh. It's a lot of the I think a lot of this uh, inflation in price is linked to Tether as well, which is. Uh, supposedly a stable coin it's supposed to be back one to one one dollar for each tether but i think auditing indicates and best analysis indicates that it's actually more like three cents to the dollar and Liverpool. tether is not backed tether is what is inflating the price of everything and there may even be a link between evergrande and uh, binance and tether tether is a product of binance is a major exchange worldwide Binance, and then they also have a u.s subsidiary finance you because actual Binance isn't allowed to do business here because they're shady. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I think that sheds a lot of light. I, li I like your guys' point of view. Last thing I think we're running out of time. Last thing I wanted to bring up since we were on Bitcoin so heavy today was this gentleman. I'm going to play two videos for you guys and uh, we'll check them out and see what this is all about. And then I'd love to hear your all's comments on this. Uh, da, da, da. Got to make sure that you're going to hear, share the sound. Uh, you must recognize this. We're, we're implementing this stuff ourselves. We're writing the software. But the only way this makes any sense, if the users really own their data, they ought to be able to import their data into a different application. They ought to be able to sign in and still access their data. The example I like to give is, I used to be a big user of Twitter, but Twitter has a lot of issues. And I basically had so much misinformation in my Twitter feed that I left Twitter. The, the problem is I had 27,000 followers on Twitter. By leaving Twitter, I, I lose my audience of 27,000 people. So I consider this, it's an example of data lock-in. The way this should work is my followers shouldn't be a part of Twitter. My followers should just be following me. I should be publishing my data in a way that isn't dependent on any particular third party and they should be able to see it and follow me. That's what following really is. That's what we're enabling. So I can now publish my data to the blockchain. 
and anybody can follow me on the blockchain. And the blockchain doesn't depend on any one particular entity. So I can have access to the same data and people can follow me using different applications and things like that. So we're really delivering on this idea of no application lock-in for your data for users. I guess that was the wrong video, but I, I like what he's saying. Uh, and it did... I like how his name is spelled wrong. <laughs> what's, what's his name? It's, I think it's Craig Wright, not Craig White. Is that who that was? I, I, that I don't wasn't know. Craig Wright. Are you talking about Dr. Fake, uh, Fake Satoshi? That's I don't know, Craig man. Like, I know. Who's, who's, who's Craig that? White? Really? I don't know. W he's, he's, well, he's at Bitcoin Apostle, and I like what he's saying about distributed identity and identities that aren't linked to somebody else's uh, you know, product, like Twitter and Gmail. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think we're their products. I think a president went through that same uh, sort of situation. That's in marketing, in my industry, it's all about owning your data. Because if there's stories of people who have built a million pe person follower on YouTube and their entire business was all done on YouTube, i.e. they'd advertise their product in a video on YouTube and then the people would buy through that channel. And then they, they broke some of the YouTube rules and were shut down. Yeah, they had an unpopular opinion and YouTube decided to, to, to censor yeah. them or shut yep. them down. Or yep. in some and cases, they, people, their business people went to zero product. because of that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think people are learning that the, you need, to, and that's what we're going to do with this podcast. We're not going to just put it on YouTube. Sure, we'll have it on YouTube. We're also going to have it on five other platforms or more. And we're yeah. going to try to figure this out. So we're not people that get stung by this. Uh, some well, people, that's why this I is that really up. egregious. Some people will post videos and they find later that they get a takedown notice because somebody else did a reaction video to their original video and then made a claim against them because they have more followers. It's insanity. Oh, wow. I've never heard of that, but it actually yeah. makes sense and, and, that people are cheating the system like that. And, 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 it, and if the person that reports them has more followers or makes more money for YouTube, they won't okay. even have a human look at it. They'll just shut your shit down. And, and then you have to appeal and good luck with that. Interesting. So. so I remember why I saved that video because I was like, hey guys, can we do this on block? So putting your data into the chain, no, that. It's not really possible. You okay. can't upload a video or a podcast or anything like that. What you can do on the blockchain is put very small amounts of data. We're talking minuscule amounts of data. You could put maybe a URL into the blockchain. Okay. Uh, anything more than sort of small bits of data like that, it's very infeasible to do it because so of... Stop right there because that's the exact point of this next video that we're going to okay. watch. All right. And I, you guys could hear that last one. Okay. Yep on this it's not that hard one megabyte blocks are the 640 uh, you know kilobyte limit of, of bitcoin all right it completely like it's completely insanely low embarrassingly low um we need far higher blocks so the the number i ran i presented this in my talk was in order to s send a single transaction to seven billion people you it would take 30 years all right so it's completely impractical to reach the world and they can't use lightning because you gotta have three transactions just to open a channel anyway the I would pitch it this way. So there are two possibilities here. One is we scale Bitcoin and the other is either way, I'm extremely bullish on crypto and I'm very bullish on the future, you know, world financial system. So the question is to what extent does Bitcoin dominate this and to what extent it doesn't? I think if we do scale Bitcoin, it stands a very strong chance of being able to completely dominate the entire future world financial system, largely due to simply the network effect of money. So if we don't screw it, it could totally win everything. So anyway, I don't really care about his opinion more than that. I was interested in what he was saying about the blocks being real small data sizes. Is that the same as what you were just saying, Grant, <laughs> about how much data you can actually put on the block? So there are lots of techniques to do this correctly. You don't need to put all the data into the chain itself, but what you want is for it to be known verifiable data. The, these are very sophisticated cryptographic techniques that you need to use to be able to enable sophisticated use cases. But just dumping raw data onto the chain is absolutely not what you want to do. You do not want to load up the chain with raw data. That's not the right. Because it'd be really, you'd have to pay a huge gas fee to get that to happen. It's just not what the technology is intended to do. And to okay. couple this back to the upgrade to Bitcoin with Taproot, 
it enables more sophisticated data verification possibilities. And that's what you need. You need sophisticated data verification. So that way you can say well, somewhere else that this data supposedly exists. That's, I know that's really from Lewis. I know that's really from Dan and I can trust it. And therefore I should go look at that. And so publishing hashes of data and then saying well, through some other mechanism, here's a channel where you can go to get access to data and know that this is data really for me that I'm publishing. That's key. You want to know that the person who's putting information out there that you know where to go look for it fundamentally, and then to say, here's new content. Okay. That so I, our, get from that. I was uh, enjoying that video too, because that was from 2016 and that was a full year before Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash, uh, split, what split into different directions. Okay. So he, obviously, <clears throat> or maybe this isn't so obvious. He was advocating that the Bitcoin as a community and as a protocol and as a, as a code base embrace this uh, change to move to increase the block size from one megabyte to what Bitcoin cash moved it to 32 megabytes up to 32 megabytes. It's not every block is that big, but it can be. And what that did for Bitcoin cash is it made the transaction costs almost negligible. You can send Bitcoin cash for fractions of it. If you want to send Bitcoin, it can cost, it'll definitely cost dollars. It's, it's impractical okay. for buying coffee, but Bitcoin cash is perfectly practical for that, except there are better protocols now. Okay. And but, that was uh, my that next question. From, yeah. Technologies now are, are some of the other coin technologies better for uh, putting this data into the blockchain? It, it depends on, uh, yes. The answer, the short answer is yes. And the, the big answer is you know, what's your goal? Are you, what do you want to accomplish? Do you want your transactions to settle fast? Do you want to be able to do a bunch of transactions or transactions per second and have that scale up to MasterCard Visa levels? Do you care about centralization or decentralization? Is that, or it's privacy. What are the goals that you're looking to accomplish? Okay. Ripple, XRP, for instance, that's a centralized blockchain. That's a corporate product. They have mainframe heavy iron monitoring this stuff and, and, and encouraging it to happen. I don't know if you can even mine it. Maybe you can, but it's very fast settlement and they're looking to replace Swift or international transactions, which can take days and cost a lot of money. Ripple can uh, settle in four, four seconds or something like that. It's, but it has limitations. You have to maintain a wallet of certain size and yada. So it's, for the uh, future crypto of for crypto, crypto, for yeah. the future of crypto or not crypto, but for, yeah, for blockchain in general, moving into other realms, other than currency, this is pretty important though, that data is because then if you're not dealing with currency, then it is all about data, right? There's a lot of techniques to do this stuff in different ways. We talked about lightning, I think was mentioned in that video. Lightning is a, what we call a layer two protocol that sits on top of the basic blockchain interaction. So there, there are lots of different ways to solve these problems. So right now, lightning network in Bitcoin sort of has substantially lower fees, faster settlement times. And what they do is they reconcile things that have happened in Lightning Network against the main chain. And they, that's a process is you do this reconciliation process. So you have the ability to do things like side chains, Lightning Networks, layer two protocols. There's a lot of really sophisticated ways that things can happen. It's not obvious that using the main layer one protocol is the right place to put gobs of data. In fact, I would say that it's not the right place to put lots of data. It's the place to put the right kind of data. And this requires sophisticated understanding of how blockchain technology works. And it's for like, again, the crypto gods who okay. point the way to the right way to do this stuff. So, you know, the naive people who say the only way to solve this problem is to increase block sizes from whatever the current block size is, the 32 megabytes. If you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> sure. Okay. Any, this has been a fascinating conversation. Of course, it went longer than I thought, but I wanted to cut, I tried to touch on every subject that I wanted and we got there. So Dan, any final thoughts before we shut this down? I just wanted to <clears throat> comment on the layer two stuff, because I know a lot of people don't know what that means and lightning. What does that mean? And to go back to the whole checkbook shared ledger technology, you know, that you share with your wife and she can see when you withdraw or, or deposit into the account, you can't go back and cross anything out and, and you can see what she does as well. Let's say you're going to go to Vegas with the boys and you see, so you go to the checkbook and you check the cash for 500, 
<clears throat> and then you go to Vegas and you, maybe I lend some money to you. You win it back at the tables and you, whatever. We get some lap dances, alcohol, whatever you do in Vegas. I don't know. I don't go there anymore. But um, Food, eat. <clears throat> at the end, you're going to have some money left, right? Like we cover each other and this and that. And all the details don't really matter so much. What matters from the layer one perspective is, am I putting any money back in the shared checking account or not? And if so, how much? So okay. I settle with you guys. That's the layer two part. And then <clears throat> I write back in the ledger, hey, I took out oh. 500, but I'm putting back 1,000. And uh, what happened? <laughs> Vegas stays in Vegas. Okay. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Layer one is the checkbook between you and your wife. Layer two is all the dealings, the monetary dealings that we do in Vegas right. between each other that also has something to do with that $500 that you took out of the checkbook. Would you agree, Grant? That's uh, it's simplified, but sure. Yeah. Is that a good uh, explanation, Grant? I'd have to think about it a little. I, the, the one that the part that tripped me up at the end was you put back a thousand, you took out five hundred. So I'm pretty sure oh, in the it. world of uh, crypto, what would have to happen would be something just a little bit more nuanced than that. But I don't think you can put back more than you started with. <clears throat> so but when you close a Lightning network, so you let's say we open up a Lightning node with a one Bitcoin, and then I sell coffee or whatever, mow lawns, and then how do I get my money back into the chain? Like, do I make any money? Do people have to commit? Isn't that what have, people have to do? They're going to commit to having me mow their lawn, so they have to devote some Bitcoin to my Lightning node? Or See, I, this is a nuanced topic of what it can exactly occur on a Lightning side chain okay. sort of uh, okay. network. But like usually the rule of thumb is you can't create or destroy. Like The only thing that creates fundamentally is mining operations that's the creation of new and that's it for the emission of new things when you get into the world of crypto space you can't destroy coins you can put them into an unclaimable address you can send them off to null or some invalid place and there are certain ways that that this has occurred and continue to occur or you can just completely lose control of a key so that it will never move ever because you lost the private key. This has occurred when certain people with private keys and don't have any custody situations like die or drown or whatever, or people just fundamentally die and didn't tell anybody the, the private key or monomic. But on side chains, I don't think you can create new coins. I'm, I'm not no, inherently right. sophisticated on these things, but I'm pretty sure that's the case that you cannot create or destroy a coin. That makes sense. But if somebody already so had a better coin, analogy they could give would be, I take 500 out and we do whatever we do in Vegas, but no matter, even if I make money at the tables, I'm only putting 500 back into the account with my wife. The rest of it's cash. It would be, it would be more like this. Let's say we open a side channel and the three of us do a bunch of stuff in Vegas. Um, and you come back and you put 150 in and Lewis puts 150 in and then I put 200 in. We preserve the 500. So the coins get distributed to whatever account we paid for stuff and did, you know, interactions on the side chain. But like when we reconcile it back, you got to find all 500 coins or you can't close that channel. And I, it might be that the reconciliation oh. of that channel, I don't know, maybe those coins can get burned over there. I'm not, not exactly sure what can really occur on a lightning channel because I'm not intimately familiar with the technical details of this stuff, but yeah, and that's like a layer two protocol here is for doing faster transactions and stuff with lower fees and it's where you're, doing something along these lines, but I don't believe you can destroy a coin. Okay. Okay. Let's leave it at that. Thanks guys for your time. Uh, this has been an episode of the third coin where we discuss the past, current and future blockchain and the crypto coin. And so don't forget to press the or follow button so that you can be alerted of when we launch a new podcast uh, until next time, gentlemen.